Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanya Emery. I'm the Director of Community and Economic Development for the City of Bangor. I'm joined by Ann Krieg, our Planning Officer. Ann and I are going to give you a few introductory comments just to start this listening session, which really is intended to be an opportunity for the public to give us input as the staff work to collect a community conversation around the idea of short-term rental regulation in the City of Bangor. I'm going to start with just a few background comments. Um, first, why are we doing this work? The effort to create this policy came from the Affordable Housing Work Group recommendations. That was a process that was finished in March of 2019. And the re recommendation at that time from that work group was to consider a policy regarding units shifting from traditional rentals, the sort of long-term uh, typical leases that you think of, to short-term rentals, such as companies like Airbnb, VRBO, and others. There was no policy guidance from the Affordable Housing Work Group at that time. It was simply asked that we should examine and consider this issue as it has had a significant impact on housing in some other communities. We, the City of Bangor has already implemented other recommendations from this planning effort, such as, such as creating a, a way to uh, do accessory dwelling units. We've reduced some minimum lot sizes, making some lots that were previously unbuildable, buildable. Um, we've also reduced some setbacks in some residential zoning districts, and all of this was done to encourage housing development and investment in the community. The second reason that we're doing this work is because this use, short-term rentals, is not currently allowed. The Land Development Code does not have it defined, so technically it's not an allowed use in the city. There are people that are renting this way. We, we know that. We are aware of that. There are people who want to rent this way, and that's why we think it's time sensitive to take up this work and to complete this conversation so we can give the city council some things to consider as they think about developing a policy. Okay. So uh, what is a short-term rental? That's part of the project actually is to define what we consider a short-term rental, but typically a short-term rental is when you are renting a room or the whole dwelling unit for a period of less than 30 days. So this means that if someone is renting a room in their house for more than 30 days to the same person or a group of people, that is, that's not a short-term rental. But that's you know what you would consider a temporary residence and not a visitor. So this distinction is important because there might be some confusion out there about um, how many people that rent tenants for a month or more, and that's not what we are discussing today. This discussion is focused on rentals that may last a night, a weekend, or a few weeks. There are some pros and cons to this type of use that we've identified through our research, but we also want to hear from you today about what you consider as residents and property owners to be some of the pros and cons. Pros might include that it provides a viable option for travelers, for, for transient workforce, for vacationers, for people transitioning from one accommodation situation to another, as well as it provides an important income stream for property owners. It can make it easier or more affordable for people to experience or visit or even relocate to Bangor, and that hopefully creates a positive impression. A con could be it could push market prices up as owners typically make more money on short-term rentals than they do in year-round situations, which is one of the concerns other markets have tried to address. The short-term rental market can also take away units from year-round renters, and there can also be changes in neighborhoods from having um, short-term tenants, for example, people who come and rent for two or three nights um, may have different behavior and patterns than people who rent year-round um, or people who own the residence. So on the city's website, there is a survey that is also seeking public input. We're trying to use um, during this pandemic crisis, trying to get public outreach the best way that we can through this workshop. We're doing another one tomorrow at 5 uh, p.m. But the focus of the survey is to give people an opportunity to register their comments. Um, it's not a scientific survey. It's more, you know, the comment section of the survey is equally as important as the yes or no box. Um, so some of the options that we're looking at that other communities have done is allowing them everywhere and make every and and make them, you know, register with the city, be have a an inspection, um, allowing them in certain districts or allowing them in single or two family um, owner occupied housing or non owner occupied housing. Or the other way is to create an overlay for neighborhoods um, where it would be allowed or or not be allowed. So that there's there's a whole host of options that the city has um, 
you know, to um, monitor or regulate the use as and so what we're looking for today is to get how you feel as the public, how you feel about the options for this use. And what will happen from today is we will take your comments and assemble them into a report in, for the uh, Business and Economic Development Committee of the City Council and also the Planning Board. We don't expect to have a final recommendation to the council, but we want to refine those options that I just listed from the public input that we get from you at these, at these workshops and through the survey. Finally, some parameters for today's discussion. Please confine your comments to short-term rentals. This is an important issue to address now as residents want direction. Um, and we are aware that the use is already happening when it is technically not currently allowed. The land development code in the city of Bangor has been around since 1940. So for over 80 years, the city has regulated some elements of how people use their property. Zoning in the land development code protects you from, for example, having a noisy, smelly factory next to your single family home. Um, and we understand that there are some people, some folks have the opinion that they would like no regulation of properties in Bangor. And the simple fact is that regulation of properties does exist in the city. So if you just don't want any zoning at all, um, that's fine comment, send us to it for another discussion. Um, but the topic at hand today is how would you like short-term rentals to potentially be regulated in your community? Um, next, we understand and respect that the use of people's property can be a deeply personal issue. Your home is likely your large, largest investment. And we know from experience that this discussion and short-term rentals in general can be divisive in many communities. We ask for your comments here to be respectful, honest, and clear. We are here to listen to you. We've allotted an hour for this event. We are able to stay a little bit longer if there are a few remaining comments, but we wanna to try to keep it to a lunch time, which I'm not really sure that that exists anymore. Um, we hope that we can get to everyone that has comments. Please use the raise hand function in Zoom so that we can call on you and we will then acknowledge you. I will say who we're calling on um, and I will start at the top of the list, just to be fair, I'll start at the top of the list and work my way down. Um, when you are called on to speak, you will be unmuted, but your video will not be turned on. So if you're not in a place where you can have your camera on right now, um, I'm jealous. And second, uh, that's not an issue. We'll just call on you via audio. Um, if you are watching on Facebook, we are not going to read those comments into that session, into this session. Instead, please type your comment on Facebook and we're going to compile all of those. Um, Mel Bickford, our amazing assistant in the development office, is watching along, and we're going to compile all of those comments as part of our final report. Um, you always have the option as well of sending an email. We have a dedicated email address, housing at bangormain.gov. Again, housing at bangormain.gov. If you have a longer comment, if you want to share uh, that email address with friends or, or family who may wish to make comment as well, um, please send us an email with any additional thoughts. And with all of that being said, Let's get started. Buster Lean, click on the button. Uh, Buster, would you like to go ahead? We'll unmute you and you can go ahead and make your comment. Thank you. Yeah, Tanya, I just curious. God, I'd like to see you guys on top of it, getting ahead of your business so your business manages you. So I appreciate that. Uh, question I have is that we did send out a blast to the Gaboma membership, 685 members. So the Zoom calls, we have an older um, uh, to the landlord association. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious on the participation through your Zoom call, you know, on how many total uh, participants you seem to be getting today. So it's hard to tell because I can't see how many people are on the Facebook feed, but we have currently have 24 attendees um, on the Zoom call. And I'm not sure if Angel can see how many people are watching on the Facebook feed or not. I don't think that's a metric that we can get. Um, but again, we are also having a second session tomorrow and email is always a great option. Um, people can also send a letter if they'd rather type it out and send a letter to us. That's also an option as well, Buster. Cool. cool. Hey, while well, you got me on, I'm not sure how many people have raised their hands. I did talk to uh, some business people that have had or have uh, Airbnbs and uh, they've shut them down due to the current situation of state that they couldn't manage through. Uh, but do we have a number in the city of Bangor of Airbnbs, or, or is that what we're trying to retain? And do you want to take that one? Yeah, it it, um, it appears that there's anywhere between, it's, it's hard to say um, a, an exact number, but at least 100. 100, cool. Yeah. cool. All right. And uh, 
And then I think that the, uh, the only comment that I'd gotten from some of these folks were that uh, it seemed to be like a hybrid between landlords or apartments and motels. You know, that's a, they thought that that was a common place and I'm not sure how you, how you do that, but that came, seemed to be where they were at in their heads. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Colleen. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, thank you. Hi, good morning. Well, now it's afternoon, ladies. Thank you for, um, as an Airbnb owner, I'm outing myself, but I think it's important for you to hear from us um, and any other people out there that I'm representing. I've been doing this for four years. It kind of happened organically and um, has been an amazing journey and a blessing. And it makes me very, very proud to be where I'm from. We have such positive experiences with our guests here. They love our city. They love our state. They come back. Some have moved back. I think you guys have done enough research. So you've heard a lot of the positive things. But as an owner, you know, there's always that feeling in the back of your mind, like, you know, we never want to function outside of our parameters. You know, we, we realize that. And it also gives some parameters for us to function within. You know, I, I agree with what you said. People, when they hear regulation, and I being one of them with everything that's going on, you automatically think of that as a negative connotation. And I have to say, when I saw this come up in the paper, that was my gut instinct. Oh no, I'm gonna lose my business because it's so great. But I think we can reach a place where we can function fully and great in our city um, and but live within some parameters that protects us as owners, protects our neighbors, protects our communities. Um, and all that. So I think we can do that together. And so I appreciate you trying to hear from us and understand um, how we function, how what we do impacts um, our lives and, and our neighbors and our community, but also to, you know, to give us some guidelines to go by so we feel more comfortable with what we're doing, just like any other business that you would have out of your home. And, you know, some of us do it out of our home directly. Some of us have freestanding homes that, um, that we manage. Um, so there's all sorts of different things, you know, come into play there. So I think that we have to look at it not as one fell swoop, but individually how, you know, whether it's a room, whether it's a, you know, in-law apartment, whether it's a multi-unit, I don't think it can be a blanket regulation. I think it might need to be looked at per, um, per property. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And, and the reason why I say that is I have some lake properties and I have a property in my house. So that those needs are very different and how I run those are very different. So I think maybe that may be something to consider going forward. But one question that I had for you is you know, you were prompted to look into this by something. So was there <laughs> have you noticed that there is a change um, and an uptick in affordable housing in our city in the past year or two? Is that what prompted you to start looking into this? And also, have you had an influx of, um, you know, negative reporting of the impacts in our neighborhoods here? Because I think we want to know that. I personally have not, but I think, you know, I think all the rest of us who may be on here who who have worked in our communities want to know if our community approves of what we're doing or disapproves. So I think it would be nice to know if there's been a large impact negatively to our community too. So um, those were my two questions for you today. Sure. Thank you, Colleen, for your input. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Just briefly to answer the sort of how we got to this, the Affordable Housing Work Group was a very broad group of public um, participation over a series of many months where we came together to try to understand we were hearing anecdotally that people were having a hard time finding housing that they considered to be affordable and of good quality in the city and we decided instead of just taking that at face value we would dig into some of the research and look at data and when we did that we realized that statistically speaking looking at people's incomes uh, in uh, as opposed to the cost of housing both for homeowners and for renters in the Bangor market the, the Bangor market is actually less affordable than Portland, which I think shocked all of us. Um, oh, yeah. People in this area typically make less money. 
Um, the income, median incomes in Portland are significantly higher. The costs are higher, but as a proportion of income, uh, homeowners and renters in Bangor are more cost burdened than those in Portland. And that was really shocking and eye opening. Yeah. And so we started to think we need to understand some of the market forces that are causing housing to be more expensive. We know, for example, there have been changes in the main uniform building and energy code that have led to it being more expensive to make renovations and repairs and that that cost typically is passed along to renters. And so we know that that was a cost driver. Um, we knew that there were other forces in the market and we thought that it was important to also take a look at, we know there are short-term rentals in the market. Is it at a point now where we can say that's what's driving our affordable housing crisis? It was not at that point where we could say that. Right. And the report was done over a year ago, pre-pandemic. Right. However, we did notice that it was creeping up and every time we'd go back and revisit it and look at the maps and look at the listings, we'd see a few more and a few more. And so we did start to get concerned that A, this is happening in our community, it's not currently regulated and that's something we need to reckon with. And B, that if this continues to increase, it could take some of the available housing stock that could be available for the people who are so important to make our, you know, we, we appreciate essential workers now more than ever um, after mm -hmm. the pandemic, but if you wanna have police officers and firefighters and teachers who live in your community, you have to have available workforce housing and so we need to make sure we're balancing those public interests. So that's a little bit about, this is one piece of what we're looking at as it, as it uh, pertains to affordable housing as a larger issue. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? The, the complaint issue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we, I, I will say in our office um, here at City Hall, we have not heard significant widespread complaints. Um, the code enforcement office very rarely has a complaint or concern. Um, from a neighbor, but I will say there have been a few instances that public safety has um, has made us aware of as we've been talking about this issue, um, where short-term rental properties, and this is a, this is not a Bangor issue, this is a national issue. Um, occasionally, short-term rentals are used for um, purposes that are not on the up and up, and I know Airbnb has been struggling with that, and, and yes. the other companies as well. And so yes. um, that is something that we have seen happen on occasion in the Bangor area. Um, it is something that certainly our PD wants to be right on top of, which is part of why, you know, maybe some sort of just registration so we know who the local owner is to contact. Um, that sort of thing became something yeah. that was on the list of things to consider. Um, I am not aware of this being a widespread complaint or concern, although as we started these listening sessions and this outreach, we have started to hear from some neighbors who say, you know, there's one in my neighborhood and there's a lot of traffic and there's a lot of turnover and and things like that, but I would not say it's widespread. I would say at this point, it appears to be very isolated. Okay, well, that's really good to know because it, it, it you know, we're in our own little bubble and it's good to know that we're not, definitely not making a negative impact. And and I would add to that, and I won't take all the time, but, I, but when you said something, I would add to that, you know, I live in a neighborhood where there is um, long-term low-income homes that have been, um, you know, flipped by, absent landlords and you know as a homeowner and taxpayer here in our city too um it, it's not really comparable but I, I would say that you know the absent landlordism is an issue too and I think you know one thing to consider when you're trying to do this regulation is most of the hosts that are in our city where you know I saw some of the comparisons were to like Boston and San Francisco and larger you know areas but most of us are just here and we're available to our guests we're available to our neighbors we're pretty hands-on I, I know quite a few people because I'm in the business who are um, just, you know, pillars of our society. And, and I would dare say that I've had more issues in my neighborhood with my absentee landlords, having non vetted long term residents who have signed a lease that make it more difficult to remove them from a property if there was any issues. Whereas if we have someone here for two or three nights, and for some reason, we vetted them improperly, and there was any issues, we can, uh, you know, we can expel them immediately. So um, those are good things to keep in, in mind when you're going through this is the, the landlord and host responsibilities and their proximity to their rental properties. That's very helpful. Thank you, Colleen. Okay, Sean Kinkley, you. you were next on my list. Hello, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Awesome, hi, good, good afternoon. Um, I'm actually on the um, Airbnb website right now looking at Bangor, Maine, and there are a lot of really nice properties on here. Um, but I do work in the moving and storage business and I talk to a ton of people, a lot of young people that are in between places, people just looking for you know a decent place to live. And um, I will say that I've observed 
there is definitely a struggle for young people, you know, middle-aged people, people of all, all parts of the spectrum that are having a hard time finding affordable housing. Um, I was wondering, is it possible to only allow certain Airbnbs? Like for example, people that, uh, you, know, you know, you have like an extra bedroom in your house and you can rent that out. Is that something that we're looking at as a possibility or would, uh, would this regulation be more or less, you know, we need to ban pretty much all of them. I don't really understand how, um, how, how, how uh, let, me, let me word this correctly. Um, how do you only ban certain types of Airbnbs? Is that something we're kind of working toward? Go ahead, Anne. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly. Hi, Sean. That's exactly what um, we're looking to do: is to to see what kinds are there specific kinds of um, short-term rentals that people feel are problematic or people feel should be allowed freely, like the rent, like you just said, a renting a room in your house. Is that different than somebody renting their house and you know that lives here the rest of the year? And, or somebody that owns an apartment building and rents the whole apartment building. You know, what are there, is there a difference between certain types of short-term rentals? That's what we're trying to get from the public. Yeah, agreed. And, um, and when you look at some of these properties, there's some like absolutely beautiful apartments in downtown Bangor that are being rented out on a short-term basis. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are people that would love to live in Bangor you know, full time and, you know, participate and grow with the economy and um, having, having those really nice housing options that aren't just being, you know, kind of like swallowed up by Airbnb and rented out on a nightly basis. And it, and it is great that people can go and experience downtown and, you know, be able to go to the bars and restaurants and Airbnb is really great because we have those options and people can come here and just explore downtown. But at the same time, I think, I think I would lean toward, you know, not allowing um, Airbnb owners to, you know, buy an apartment building and then rent out an actual apartment. I think, I, I think I do agree with a lot of people that you know we need to we need to safeguard people that are trying to make a little extra income in their in their own homes, and then maybe uh, think more about you know these properties just being bought bought for Airbnb. So, thank you for taking my comment, and that's uh, those are my thoughts on it. Thank you very much, Tom, for sharing. We appreciate it. Jason Fish, you're up next. Thank you, Rob. Hey, Tanya. Hey, Ann. Hey. Hi. Hey. hey, how are you? Um, I do quite a bit of a development in Bangor. Um, I've flipped six properties this past year. A few of those remain as Airbnbs. Sorry, I'm one of the guilty ones. Um, when you say restrictions now, are you just talking there's nothing on the books that's defining what those restrictions are? I mean, because I, when I look through it, there's nothing in there that really restricts it. I know it's not allowed, but there's nothing specific in the books to say like what is allowed and what isn't allowed. So now you're trying to come up with a structure to define those purposes. We are um, exactly. Being in real estate and in construction and owning Airbnbs in multiple cities, um, I've seen this num you know, numerous times over and it's, it's great that you guys are asking the public their opinions. And I, I hope to hear from a few people, uh, specifically one individual who manages over 40 of these. Um, so affordable housing, as you understand it, right? You have a lot of forces at hand. It's not just what's going on in the market. Uh, you know, development's extremely expensive right now. Materials are through the roof. Uh, we have a number of new residents coming from out of state that are coming to this area specifically, maybe not just Bangor, but surrounding towns. That's rising the cost. So affordable housing, to me, it's very difficult. And I know it's a difficult job that you have because it's not, you can't define it, right? Um, you're gonna build a new house, a new development, what's gonna happen is those prices are just gonna be priced higher because people coming in are paying more than the average person can afford, pushing the prices. In my opinion, I've talked to Code about this several times, is to help a little bit, and I think a lot of people on here will agree, with some of the older stock that we have, if there is a way around some of these regulations, especially the move back code and other code, uh, to help people get into these older properties. No one wants to touch them. I don't want to touch anything, you know, older than 1978. Um, it gets very difficult and cumbersome. Uh, and I think that you're going to find a lot of these pro property owners, like the lady was just um, talking about, uh, these, these platforms that we use, these Airbnb and VRBO, 
they're all self-policing. They're all self-governing. Um, the user can complain about the host. The host can complain about the user. Host can get booted off the platform if the police get called. They have a lot of things in place and Airbnb has been doing a really good job of that. So some of those issues are kind of being taken care of on their own. Um, what I worry about is the money and the time that we've spent renovating some of these properties uh, to turn them into Airbnbs where families come and stay here. And I'd rather them come and stay here when the hotels are full and stay in Bangor and spend their money at a local restaurant or go to the grocery store, or they're here for a reason to go to the concerts, even though those haven't been happening. And I think that the complaints that if you've heard any have probably been in, in this recent year with COVID. Um, I've had them happen at one of our properties. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've dealt with uh, local police. They've been awesome. Um, and we've had to kind of change hands and do like the short term with the nurses or do something different to kind of get ourselves through this. Um, so it hasn't been easy on us. And I know that a lot of these people who have these properties, they're, a lot of them are top end properties and they have top end managers who are taking care of these properties. And my only question or my only, I guess, comment is if we're gonna go back and we're gonna self-regulate uh, or the city's going to regulate and make us register these, I think it's time to inspect everyone because there is housing stock out there that has not been seen that is not suitable for living, in my opinion, all over the city. And if we're going to blanket this, we need to do it fairly for everyone. Thank you, Jason. I think you know from paying attention to this work for a while, um, the city and our office in particular has proposed a rental registration program for a couple of years. We've not been able to fund it and we did not propose it um, this year because of the pandemic because a rental registration program for all properties would result in dislocations and we did not think that was fair during the pandemic. So that is still, I would say on the medium burner, it's not on the back burner, um, but we certainly agree with you. We know that there are some properties that, um, that are not up to standards and many of them have significant livability issues that we are very concerned about. Um, so I think that's a really good point that you've raised. Thank you. Okay, Paul Willett, you are next on my list. Can you hear me now? I can, thank you. Okay, great, thanks for having this. Uh, <clears throat> we appreciate uh, hearing the input from um, others and, and yourselves. Um, we own some properties here in Bangor. They're, they're all long-term rentals um, and uh, they are newer properties. I, I agree with the previous commenter that some of the older properties need work. Uh, they're, not, they're not the properties that we look for because they're, they're more work. Uh, so whatever regulations uh, become uh, enacted as a result of, of this meeting and this research and that, that you're doing, I would think and hope that it would cause uh, all these properties or more properties to become safe, decent, sanitary, safety being the uh, highest priority. Uh, I welcome some regulation. I, I don't want to be overregulated. So, uh, and I hope that uh, this, this continues, uh, you know, whatever regulations do, uh, become enacted, if any, as a result of this. I hope that uh, there's a continuous review of it to see how effective it is and uh, maybe make changes that uh, might be uh, needed. So that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Paul. D. Simonson, you are next on my list. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, I'm not, not sure if I can... Uh, uh, you know, add much to uh, what was previously said from uh, two uh, speakers ago um, that uh, he's an Airbnb owner and I'm one as well. Um, he made some really good points and I, I just wanted to say that uh, I believe the availability of, of housing at uh, reasonable rates is only one economic consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, short-term rentals that, you know, generally create other economic advantages for the community, such as bringing visitors to the city, and ge they generally spend more than you know the average homeowner or or renter. Uh, they uh, uh, use services that uh, generally you know only are used on a on an occasional basis by the the uh, long term residents, and uh, they promote uh, service industry jobs for property management, housekeeping, maintenance, etc. And these properties are usually maintained at a higher level 
to promote the uh, viability of the property as an attractive place to stay. Um, there's continual upkeep and monitoring of the property. I uh, monitor my properties, even though I may be away, I uh, constantly check on them. Uh, I can see you know, cameras on every side of the property that uh, look out uh, towards the road to uh, see you know, what's going on. Is anybody uh, uh, negatively impacting my neighbors? Um, I stay in touch with my neighbors. Uh, to make sure that they're happy with the, the people that have been staying at my property. Um, these are not things that I, you know, and I've been a landlord since the 90s. Uh, these are not things that landlords generally do. Uh, these are not, uh, you know, I'm concerned uh, not only for my business uh, maintaining a high standard, uh, but that um, you know, I, I continue to have a uh, relationship uh, with, you know, my, my neighbors that uh, will promote my business. Um, uh, the, you know, the monitoring that I do uh, is to keep a high level of attraction uh, that it's important to a short-term rental property owner. Um, and I, I wish to, you know, maintain that, uh, because I've, I've gotten a lot of benefit out of it. And I think my neighbors have as well. This property is something that I would live in myself if I was not currently using it as an Airbnb property. Um, it's not something that I'd make available at a, at a uh, affordable um, housing price because it's something that it, it, it uh, attracts the higher uh, income earners to it. Uh, people that are going to be interested in uh, staying at something that's more upscale. Um, so, you know, uh, discouraging me from uh, doing Airbnb with this property or any other kind of short-term rental uh, would actually uh, push me out of the area. I would look to probably sell the property and, and look in another area for uh, an opportunity. Um, you know, as was said before, the, the city of Bangor has a lot of older rental properties that are in poor condition and they don't generate the kind of rental income necessary to make regular improvements. Um, we're talking about two to three times the income opportunity for doing short term rentals uh, over renting on a long term basis. And that in turn gives me the income to turn around and improve this property on a regular basis. Um, there's plenty of examples where these older rental properties have been converted into short-term rentals. I'm aware of them. I know who the players are and what they've done with these properties. And it's amazing what they've done. And significant improvements have been made based on this opportunity for increased rental income. So, uh, this is something that if you, you could shoot yourself in the foot if you uh, are too heavy handed on uh, short term rentals. That's, That's very much all I want to say. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. We appreciate it. Uh, the next hand I see is Leslie Anderson. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, another uh, self-disclosure. Um, I also uh, run an Airbnb, but I am maybe the first person who, um, who lives here. It's, it's my house um, and I have um, the ability to have a private entrance and bedroom and bathroom that I can, uh, that I can offer to people. Um, and so uh, I, have, I have been watching sort of the regulation process of Airbnb and short-term rentals around the country. I have not yet made up my mind about what I think, how I think Bangor should approach this. So I'm kind of listening uh, to be more informed. I do have some questions and then um, some comments just about my personal situation. Uh, my first question is, when we're talking about affordable housing in Bangor, do we have a price range for properties 
that we consider to be affordable housing? We do not. The okay. general the general term affordable housing is housing that people can afford without being cost burdened. Um, a federal benchmark that's been used for a long time is that um, the goal is that people do not spend more than 30% of their income on housing. Um, we've seen that in a lot of situations, people particularly of lower income brackets spend upwards of 50% of their income on housing sometimes. And so the idea is that in order for there to be affordable housing for the wide range of income earners in your community, there needs to be a wide range of housing available at different price points. Okay, so my, my follow-up um, question, though uh, it's, it's impossible to answer, so it's more of a rhetorical thought point, I suppose, um, is how many of the short-term rental properties, which are whole apartments or whole houses, would actually convert to being affordable housing. When I first moved to Bangor several years ago, I actually looked at apartments and I looked at downtown apartments. I earn more than the average Bangor citizen and those, pro those were out of my price point. So, um, you know, if you're looking at downtown apartments being put back on the property market, um, I don't know that those would constitute affordable housing, but, um, but that's just um, a quest, you know, uh, yeah. musings. Thank you for recognizing a rhetorical question that can't be answered. <laughs> I, um, I think what we've seen in the last 10 years in particular, um, the renovations that we've seen in downtown Bangor, and, the, and when I talk about downtown, I mean the core business district around Maine and Broad and Hammond and State um, and Central Streets, those have typically been higher end properties that have been renovated at a at a higher end price point. Many of the people who have um, who have located in those units are either um, you know retirees who are looking for a more urban walkable experience and uh, you know maybe selling a large home in the suburbs that they don't want to take care of anymore. Um, people at a generally higher income bracket, and so we're well aware that 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 particular market has definitely gone towards the higher end um, tenants that are looking. There's also uh, what I call the next concentric circle out from downtown, which we call downtown adjacent neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods that are still very walkable, have lots of great amenities, where we're really trying to seed um, the investment and the redevelopment in some of those properties that may have deteriorated. Um, and we're trying to, as we're able, if we acquire a property for tax foreclosure, make it available to someone who can renovate it at a price point that's generally affordable. Um, if we have two proposals, for example, for a property and one, one developer says, I'm going to invest X on of dollars and I'm going to rent it out at the top end of the market. It's going to be $3,500 a month for these units. They're going to be luxury. And somebody else says, well, I'm going to, I'm going to invest less, but I'm going to make it into workforce housing that might go for $1,100 a month. The city's interest may be to make it at that more affordable price point. So that may be where we make our decision. But I will tell you, the number of times we get to do that is very, very small. We do not take a lot of properties. Unfortunately, a lot of the properties we end up owning are in such poor condition that they have to be torn down and, and completely started over. And the costs of those redevelopments are often at a price point where um, they're, they're just not able to be as affordable as we'd like them to be. So we're certainly aware that, for example, if the city decided to eradicate Airbnbs and, and all those downtown units that are being airbnb had to now become um, available for long-term rentals, that's not going to fix the workforce housing problem and the affordable housing problem. No one's talking about eradicating anything. We're just trying to get a sense for, as we're talking about regulations, what are some of the things that the community would generally find more palatable, um, more interesting and, and more acceptable in their neighborhood and their community um, than some other options? Thank you. Thank you for that insight. Sure. Um, so then, if you don't mind, um, my next question, um, I read through the sort of the preparatory materials and there is talk about registering properties and doing um, some sort of safety inspection. And I was curious whether there's yet a proposal for say registration costs and what that inspection would entail. There is no current proposal. I will tell you that um, if that's something that the community and the council expresses interest in, um, we would probably try not to reinvent the wheel. We have two existing processes that we would probably try to merge into something. And this is just, you know, taking existing resources and trying to put something together that might fit. Um, the first is in 2013, the city enacted a vacant property ordinance. 
that was 100% in response to the problems that we have with absentee landlords. And we often would have an issue where a property would fall into disrepair, the property taxes were still being paid, but the owner was a million miles away, hadn't looked at the property in forever, and the neighbors were just at their wits end. Um, sometimes rodents become an issue. Sometimes we, you know, we had a, an outbuilding that was falling on someone else's property, just a myriad issues um, to deal with. The vacant abandoned property registry was a way for us to say, look, if you are vacating a property and it becomes vacant and you have no intent to return, you need to register it with us and provide a local contact. And we're going to from time to time, if we drive by our code enforcement officers are out in the city every single day and they notice a significant problem with the property, we have someone that we can call that can rectify the problem. Um, I cannot remember off the top of my head, again, it's been seven years since we implemented it. Um, I cannot remember off the top of my head what the registration fees are, but they're relatively modest, um, maybe 50 or hundred dollars. I, I, and I, I apologize that I can't recall, but I can certainly get that answer for you. Um, that program exists. And so if there was an interest from the community and from the council in saying, hey, we do think it's a good idea to allow these, but we should have a local contact, we already have a method and a process to do that. I have no idea if they would charge a fee. That's, you know, I think that's far down the road. I'm just using that example mm -hmm. as one place where we've done something similar. For inspections, um, if you go through, uh, for example, you pull a building permit and you, you're gutting a property, you have to go through a full code inspection and bring everything up to today's standards. Just for the record, those standards are not standards that the city of Bangor chose. Move Act, the main uniform building and energy code is something that is enforced and mandated. It's mandated to us by the state of Maine. We do not get to pick and choose which of those codes we enforce. Um, that is a uniform code for the state of Maine. We have to abide by those standards. However, if you are doing um, you know, a modest renovation that doesn't trigger a full-blown code review and there's just one minor life safety thing that we need to feel like that property is in better shape and safer, it might be carbon monoxide or smoke detectors. It might be um, getting rid of extension cords. You wouldn't believe the problems we have with extension cords. Um, things like that that are really life safety issues. We have a process where our fire department does what we call engine company inspections. It's a very straightforward, like a half sheet inspection form, looks at you know 10 or so basic life safety things. Is there safe egress? Uh, is there uh, you know smoke detectors? Are the receptacles general life safety? Um, those might be the sorts of things that if there's interest in some sort of inspection, um, that it would be along those lines, not a full-blown top to bottom, soup to nuts, your Victorian banister in your grand home is two inches too short, therefore you can never use it for anything. Um, that's, that's not what I think the staff is looking at as we're looking at options. Um, I think we wanna be really pragmatic um, about recognizing how these properties can be used. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've taken a lot of time, so I'll just do a quick summary of sort of my property and what I see as being the benefits to the community of my property specifically. Um, and then I will, I will stop talking. <laughs> um, so I uh, own um, an older house. Um, the original part is from 1837 and that's part of, those are the, the rooms that I, I rent on Airbnb. Um, I, my very first visitors were from New Zealand. Um, I've had a lot of Stephen King fans, a lot of, not this year, but, uh, or not 2020, but in 2019 I had retirees, traveling the Northeast and, you know, people uh, kind of kind of on long road trips. Um, I've had uh, people coming to go to University of Maine, to Hassan, um, you know, visiting, people visiting family, people who are doing renovations on their own houses and need a place to stay. And one of the things that I offer is I'm pet friendly. So if anybody's on the Airbnb site, you should be able to find me at this point. <laughs> um, um, so I had an emergency vet who came to do a shift at the emergency vet in Brewer and she brought her three dogs and cat with her. Um, and you wouldn't be able to do that if you were going to stay at a hotel, right? So there's a flexibility that I can offer as a homeowner um, to work with guests, to provide what they need without having to worry about, you know, sort of the, the things that the, the proper innkeepers kind of have to um, organize. Um, I don't make a huge amount of money from the Airbnb. I mean, I make it enough to make it worthwhile and to help me 
with renovations to the property, but I couldn't pay my mortgage solely on that income. It's supplementary for me. And because it is an older house, there are a lot of updates to wiring and plumbing I'm trying to make. And so it is a help to me. Um, and it's nice to be able to share. Um, I'm walkable to downtown. Um, it's just nice to be able to welcome people who want to see Bangor go to Acadia and all that kind of stuff. So um, it has been a, a good thing for me to have it. Um, and I would like to keep it, uh, assuming my banisters are acceptable for the city. Um, so yeah, thank you for having these hearings and I'm um, you know, really interested in the outcomes. Thank you so much, Leslie, thank for you. sharing. We appreciate it. Uh, the next hand I see is C. Michaels. And I'm not gonna assume that I know who it is, but C. Michaels, are you there? It is. It's Cindy. Hi, Hi Tanya. Cindy. How are you? <laughs> How are you? Hi, Anne. I'm well. Uh, well, I wanted to speak up as an out-of-town host. Um, uh, I've owned my home in Bangor for 27, almost 28 years now. My son grew up there, as you know, and um, it's it's something that Airbnb has allowed me to come back and visit and still on my home. I did the uh, long-term rental uh, issue thing for a while. There were, it was very hard finding people who qualified for that, um, put me in a bad position. And uh, I went to Airbnb and been doing Airbnb for four years now. And I absolutely love it. it it's a, a supplemental income that I really uh, can't live without. And um, so I wanted to, I heard about this through friends and, and I wanted to pipe in. So I am very present in my property. Uh, I don't let it go. I stay on top of it as much as possible. And which is almost 24 hours a day, just through co communication through my manager and cleaning company and the guests as well. And I want to echo uh, what, you know, some of the things that Colleen and Jason said, Colleen, I know as well. Hi, Colleen. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's a great opportunity to bring income to Bangor. Um, and also Airbnb, as Jason was saying, stays on top of, of the hosts and the guests. There's a lot of rules and regulations with keeping things clean and things like that, um, just to name one of them. But the, the, you know, another positive thing about having the Airbnb, I know some you know, neighbors, unless they're 24 hour watching a property, you really wouldn't know it exists. Um, there's no signage like a hotel has. There's no valet parking in and out and cars going in and out all the time like, like a, a larger you know, hotel facility. So it's, it's like a home and that's what it, it was meant to be. So um, that's kind of a positive thing. And I just wanted to, uh, to point that out. Um, uh, and my neighbors, from our surrounding neighbors have been very supportive. In fact, they, they sometimes laugh and they say, well, you're making the, the, the neighborhood look better and you're and making it look good and you're making us look bad. Now we have to start fixing up our home. And, and so uh, that's a positive too. And, um, you know, it's just been a success. Uh, I, I can't speak for the other hosts, but I have absolutely loved it. It's my connection to Bangor since I, since I went, you know, back to California. Um, I, like I said, my son grew up there. I was there for many, many years and uh, I've owned the home for almost 28 and I don't want to let it go, but an Airbnb keeps it going. Otherwise I'd have to sell the house and, um, and I just don't want to do that. I want to stay connected. So I just wanted to, to pipe in there and, and give you my sense as an out of town host uh, and that, uh, you know, there is the possibility and obviously I'm doing it to stay on top of it as an out of town host. Um, I mean, I don't, I'm probably more anal than a lot of people <laughs> in terms of like, okay, I got to get this in the heat. The heat uh, and, and everybody calls me. I mean, a, a host, I have a really good ho reputation with hosts, uh, sorry, um, the guests, they feel comfortable in, you know, if something goes wrong, I am accessible. Uh, I'll answer the phone in the middle of the night. So I am on top of that property. Um, and I just uh, wanted to put in my two cents here. And so thank you for giving me the moment. Thank you, Cindy. Nice to hear from you from so many miles away. And <laughs> I appreciate you speaking to that uh, long distance ownership angle as well. That's very helpful. So thank you. Okay, cool. Um, I do not see anyone else with their hand raised. Uh, oh, Dominic Rizzo. Dominic, are you ready? There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you, Dominic. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Anne. Thank you for having this uh, this afternoon. And Anne, I love the pamphlet of information that you put together. It was very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. I basically agree with a lot has, that has been said. I mean, I am someone who hopefully and would like to do an Airbnb, 
by renting out a bedroom as a, an older adult, particularly, I like to, my partner and I would like to be able to age in place uh -huh. and, and feel, and also as a former B&B owner, I would love to have people come here and tell them all about Bangor, what I love about Bangor. So I agree with, again, mostly of what was said. I do believe there should be some sort of limitations. I mean, I do think that owner occupied properties to begin with, I'm not saying others shouldn't have Airbnbs, but I do think an actual, where the host is living on the property, it makes a difference. I mean, people, I understand that people's properties are probably some of the most beautiful properties in town because they would have to be in order to get good reviews and stay active. Um, but there's something, and I'm just going to, and again, I don't disapprove of that. There's something missing. There's the preservation of the character of a neighborhood where you have your year round people who are living here. And even if there aren't any issues, with the rental, you're missing, you know, part of what's wonderful about Bangor and why I, I grew to really love it is the neighborhoods are great and the people in them are wonderful. We support one another and uh, when we need it. Um, and I think we're missing out on that in this conversation. And I wanted to just interject this because you know, we, I had an Airbnb across the street from where they, they no longer live there. And there was a, a wonderful Airbnb. And in fact, I was happy for them. I said, oh, they're doing an Airbnb and they're busy. And that's great. They were owner occupied for most of the time. And the people who rented were quiet, basically. You really didn't know that they existed. And this is basically almost across the street from where I live. The only issue was there was a short period of time when um, the owners didn't live there. And, there was, and they did allow pets, which I have no issues with. But if you have a, doc, a barking dog, if you're, if you're living there, you know it sooner than later. And you're kind of putting your neighbors in the situation where, okay, I feel kind of um, badly about having to call them about complaining or calling the downtown city of Bangor, you know, just to complain. That's my, my concern is the, the fabric of a community. Um, there's a negative part of it. There, no doubt about it. There are lots of positives. And believe me, as an air, as a b and former owner, bringing people to an area and, and, and going to restaurants and believe me, totally for it. I'm, I'm for it in general, but I do want to interject. There is a, a difference between owner-occupied and non-owner occupied. Even if you have a manager, I do believe there's a difference. And I'm not saying to not allow it, but if you have someone who has a, even owner occupied, a multifamily of three or more units, maybe we could say X amount of units only allow, like, or if it's, even if it's not owner occupied, if you have a four family, a two family, maybe one unit, or I, I'm not telling you this is what you should do. Sure. But maybe we need to have a little bit of limits because also I was a part of the City of Bangor Affordable Housing Workshop. And yes, they're not necessarily affordable apartments that we're taking away, but at least currently there are people who want to move in to Bangor and stay year round and be part of the life of the neighborhood that we belong in and become neighbors to me and to other people, as opposed to someone who's coming for a day or two or three, whatever. So. Uh, I want to be uh, considered of that, uh, us to consider that. And also, um, you know, again, as I said, I was, well, I was part of the Bangor Livable Community Group. And, and as I said, as an older person, it would be helpful to be able to rent out a room in addition to just, just to help out. Everyone could always use a little extra money. And, and also I, I would be looking forward to um, actually, um, just uh, selling Bangor to people. And the good thing about this as a former b, &B owner who was not the cook is I do not have to cook. <laughs> they wouldn't want necessarily what I prepare basically, but, uh, uh, but that's a big plus. I mean, Airbnb and, and things like that uh, are really, I think making a lot of people uh, bring, bring a plus into their life because you're meeting all these people from all over. And, and I, I do, and again, I don't, I hate talking negatively, but we do have to just consider 
some of the negative uh, parts of it. And that is these wonderful neighborhoods that we have in Bangor that if too many people start doing Airbnbs, it will have some sort of effect. It may not be, for someone who's not living here year round, they may not know it. They're thinking of it as, I have a beautiful house, I'm renting it out and, you know, and helping downtown businesses. Uh, but the neighborhood suffer a little bit. Uh, just uh, there is a, a negative to it. So I guess that's basically my, my comment is, yes, I love Airbnb, but there should be uh, inspections and, and some sort of regulations with it. Great. Thank you, Dominic. And I know I want to thank you for you've done a lot of work as a volunteer in the community, being part of our livable, livable communities work um, and our affordable housing group. And I know you're always uh, an anxious and willing volunteer. And we appreciate that very much. Thank so thank you. you. And I'm just seeing everyone in person. I can't yeah. wait to see you in person. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dominic. Now, I do have two people that have raised their hands again. And I want to wait to make sure I don't miss anybody that would like to comment for a first time before I go back to the two that have raised their hands again. So I'm just going to pause for a moment if anybody is desperately trying to get to the raise hand button. Okay, I don't see anybody. So I'm going to go back to Colleen. You have your hand raised again. Colleen, are you still there? Um, I am. Okay. It just took a minute for the unmute. Sorry, but I was um, just taking notes and hi, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> um, at one point, uh, I just wanted to address the party situation. Um, I know that's a concern. Actually, I did a little piece on the news about that last year. Um, Airbnb, and there's no, many platforms, but um, that seems to be the most popular one. And the one that I see that really works really hard to try to work with the hosts uh, to be great hosts in their communities and to support us doing that. And um, so they did uh, make some regulations and I've had this happen to me as a host with somebody local tries to book. Um, if they're within a, I think it's 50, 30 or 50 miles, somebody can correct me, but 30 or 50 mile radius of our home. So they're local people and they try to book our home for more than eight or 10 people, then Airbnb automatically blocks them and makes it unable for them to do that because what they've found is that, and I had it happen to me at one of my lake houses and, and you know, the poor people were just coming for a birthday party. So, but in their mind, they're like, oh, we'll rent this house and then we'll invite all of our friends to come over because we're staying there. And, you know, it's just, um, I think a lot of us hosts do a lot of training with our guests about what's acceptable in the neighborhoods and what's not. And, you know, like they've said before, we have to keep stringent standards or we will lose our business. So it's a behooven to us to keep our properties neat and tidy and clean and regulated. And they do have requirements. We have to have carbon monoxide, carbon uh, dioxide, um, you know, CO2 um, and fire extinguishers, first aid kits, we have to supply and we have to show pictures of sanitary measures. Um, they are very supportive of us of being responsible um, business owners and, and we are self-regulated. And, but like we said, the, the back and forth of reviewing will put us under if we don't provide safe and clean places for our people to stay. So that being said, when you're looking at regulating um, to target, I know we're just talking about short-term rentals, but a lot of us have thrown in the long-term thing because it's hard to have one without the other when we live symbiotically together in these neighborhoods. Um, if you're going to put some regulations forth, I agree with a previous commenter that it needs to be across the board, long, short, you know, it's hard to just segregate the short term. And I know that a lot of them, especially Jason, who has taken properties and flipped them, they've enhanced neighborhoods. And I dare say that some of these homes that have been bought up and, you know, redone and have improved the neighborhoods, but those like I was thinking, those are not going to be affordable if we were to turn them over to the community. So I, I love the idea of what you guys have done. I love to see these abandoned homes being taken down and replaced by homes. So what we're providing to our community is so much more than a place to sleep. And 
So I'm very proud to be part of that. And I'm very thankful for the rest of you here today to share some of these great things we are doing. And hopefully we can come up with something that will keep us able to keep this in our community, um, but also put at ease the minds of, you know, our neighbors or our city councilmen to make sure we're following within the parameters. So thank you for listening to us. That's very helpful. Thank you, Colleen. I do have one new hand raised. Uh, ben Harriman, would you like to go ahead? Just one second, you'll be recognized and then you should be able to speak. It's my technical producer. Yes. Okay. While she's uh, figuring this out, I'll just quickly add that um, this conversation is great to have now we're, we're, we're actually trying to be very proactive often in planning um, and working on regulation we're reacting to something and we're in a great position as a city to be more proactive so this is good thank you ann so ben when our producer tries to um, recognize you as an attendee it says your version of zoom is a little bit older so she can recognize you by promoting you to a panelist. However, that means I think your video may come on. So I wanna warn you and give you the option. <laughs> um, if you keep your hand raised, I'll have her go ahead and do that. And if you don't want that, just feel free to disconnect and you can call us or email us afterwards. Okay, Angel, go ahead and promote Ben to a panelist. Hey, there he is. Okay. Hey, Ben. And we just need to unmute you. There. Success. <laughs> Yay. Oh, oh, we're still having issues with you. Ben, hang on. We still can't hear you. Is your mic, can you get closer to your mic or turn your volume up? 